IMF, World Bank, all other institutions. They make African countries jump through hoops. Loans will never be able to pay. The US, when they borrow money, they're getting it in 1.5, 1.9 interest rate. Africans, when they get the same amount of money, they're paying 9, 10%. The people who don't need a break, they get a break. The ones who need a break, they don't get a break. The sheer survival of the World Bank IMF is based on the fact that African countries and, and many other developing countries do not succeed. Their success is based on our failure. You know what, I, I, I don't even know what to do right now because I can't believe that I'm here with you. I mean, I've been a big fan since China days and seeing you for the first time, I think you're even more beautiful in real life. <laughs> It's also wonderful getting to Dr. see you in Arizona. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's my name. Is, is that you? <laughs> ah, no, I can't believe this. I just can't believe this. You know, when I received the call and it's Dr. Arakan is saying, what am I? I'm like, she knows me. <laughs> you watch my videos? Of course, I watch all your videos. The one you did on Zimbabwe, I think as soon as you released it, so many people sent it to me. Really? You did a great job. Thank you. This is not what I expected for Dr. Arakana to actually invite me to her house. This is your home, son. Oh! <laughs> See, now I have a new mom. She said, yes, this yes, is your yes. home, son. Next time you come to Arakana, you stay here. Where is this place? This is the headquarters for African Diaspora Development Institute. And we are calling it Africa House Zimbabwe. Finally, you have a headquarters. Yes, we have a headquarters. Where was the baby born? The baby was born in, uh, believe it or not, Tennessee in the United States. That's when all the ideas started and came together. You know how I got to know you? Huh? Today, France is taking out of Africa, Francophone Africa, over $500 billion. Over $500 billion. We, the Africans, the poor countries, we are giving France over $500 billion a year. Year in, year out. And no one is talking about it. The first speech that terminated your contract yeah. as the AU ambassador to America. No, actually the termination came like six months later. I had been expecting it. And uh, I was aware of some phone calls that had been made. And so I was just waiting for that phone call to say, okay, your days are numbered. Yeah, I don't know. But it took, it took them six months to do that. But you are speaking, for your, okay. you're speaking for your people. I was only speaking the truth. That's why my conscience was very clear. And, um, and I will continue to speak the truth. It's just that our people don't like the truth, I guess. I think our people want the truth. It's the powers that be that don't like the truth. Our people are looking up. What are the powers that you're talking about? You've always been talking about the problem of the continent, but mm -hmm. I'm here today. I really want to ask you, now you're living in Zimbabwe, right. what is the problem of Africa? Oh, sir, that is, uh, that is the deep question. Uh, deep as it is, it's also a very simple one at the same time. I like to take it back to when we were getting our independence. I think the issue of um, Africa really goes back to, of course, colonization was a serious problem. Uh, but at independence, we were given what I call fake independence, where economic liberation was never given to us. The multi multinationals that were in Africa during colonization, they never left. They're still here. They're still doing their dirty work. They're siphoning billions of dollars out of Africa. For example, 75% of the uh, minerals traded at the London Stock Exchange are from Africa. They're not owned by us. 75%. They're not owned by us. This has been going on since colonization, even before colonization. So the robbing and raping of Africa never stopped with independence. These leaders were given fake independence. Why is it that we get
coffee and tea from Switzerland. Have you seen the large coffee fields in Switzerland? A good portion of that is coming from our beloved continent. Why are these countries allowed to get away with relabeling African products as their own? You don't control your own financial system. So how independent are you? So to really summarize Africa's issues, it goes back to independence and the fact that we are still yet to attain economic liberation. Allow me to classify the issues, the reasons why this tree of life that is Africa is ailing. And I'm going to divide the issues between the two. Problems that are causing this tree to ail, but problems above the root, above the ground. And issues that are making this tree ail that are below the ground, issues of the root. Quite often, we are focusing on the issues above the root, issues above the ground. Issues like the leaves and the flowers and the fruits and the branches that are falling off one season after another. Those issues like leadership, issues like corruption, issues like poor access to healthcare, poor education, poor infrastructure. Those are all issues above the ground. They come and they go. We change leaders every day in Africa. But tell me one African country that changed a leader and things changed. We might see some improvement, but fundamentally. The French speaking countries, former French colonies are even in a worse shape in the sense that uh, the pact for the continuation of colonization, which I spoke to, spoke on, it continues to make the Af uh, African countries, those 14 African countries, deposit their bank reserves with France to this day. Mm -hmm. uh, the only difference is it started at 85% and now it's down to uh, about 55, 65. But they're still depositing their bank reserves. And if they wish to borrow some of that money they've been put, depositing for years, they have to put in an application as a loan. And they can only access 20% of what they deposited the previous year as a loan at commercial interest rates. I want to underscore that. They can only borrow their own money upon approval of an application after submitting their country financials. If approved, they can only access 20% of the previous year's deposit as a loan at commercial interest rates. That is our reality. It gets better. They were also told that if you need any military equipment, you can only purchase it from France. Your military can only be trained by France. That France will have military presence in your own country and can invade you without notice should they feel French interests are being violated. Language of instruction shall be French. All your minerals discovered, yet to be discovered, France has the first right of refusal. All the contracts, big contracts, private and public, French companies have the first right of refusal. Now, my brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, if you were to go home and run for president, and your first day in office, your chief of staff comes to you and says, oh, by the way, Mr. President, Madam President, before you start, I must read you the do's and don'ts as stipulated by the pact for the continuation of colonization. And your chief of staff reads this to you. What power do you have? We don't even print our own money, most of the countries in Africa. Forget printing money. When you have to borrow your own money, how much power do you have? Because printing money, you also have to pay for printing your own money for you. They are printing you know, the, um, all their money for them. All the money is printed in now, in, 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 in France. Uh, it gets worse, so you give up your financial control, your military, equipment, training has to be done in France, your natural resources, 
discovered, yet to be discovered. Mm -hmm. French companies, they first right of refusal. So you've given up your natural resources, you've given up your military control, you've given up your financial control, and you still call that person a leader. What are they leading? You have stripped them of anything that they can do to be a true leader. That's why I say it's a fake independence. Until we as a people, as Africans, understand the root causes of why Africa is where it is today, it's going to be very difficult for us to come up with a plan that can get us out of the situation that we are in. Do African leaders know this problem? Oh yes, they do. But like I said, they're fighting with their hands tied. And because they're fighting as small little countries, and this is where we're being defeated as well. Then they followed it with colonization, a systematic way of saying, now that we have made the African believe that everything African was bad and everything European was better, let's take it to the next level. So it is that they met in Berlin and decided to chop up our country, our continent rather. So it is they met in Berlin, Germany at the invitation of the then Chancellor of Germany, Bismarck, specifically to come up with a strategy that once again would see to it that Africa and her children are forever defeated and dominated. They spent four months, four cold months in Berlin, Germany, from November of 1884 to February of 1885. And by the time they were done, our Africa had been chopped up into the tiny little countries that we see today. Countries that were intentionally divided in such a way that individually they will never survive. That individually they are easy to exploit. The whole purpose was to see to it that they can continue to exploit the rich natural resources that we were endowed with in our beloved continent. back against uh, China? How is Togo going to push back against European nations? Are you with me? That, uh, that, is, the, that is the biggest problem. So we, which means that we need to unite as Yeah, no question about it. That's what Kwame Nkrumah was talking about. That's what the Casablanca group was all about. We cannot survive without unity. End of story. So really of the pillars of development, of the pillars of Africa's development and Africa's unity, which you talk about, we need our own financial system, our own single currency, central bank, monetary fund, stock exchange, African. We need our own military. We need our own, uh, uh, now we managed uh, with trade. That's the only one we've managed to really begin to show and have a semblance of some unity through the AFCFTA. I think it's just a building. Which... It's a building and its implementation is going to be a challenge. Uh, even now as we speak, you had problems coming here. You say, why should you have problems traveling throughout Africa? If we now have the, the free trade area, why are we now not just traveling freely? That free movement of people, it's spoken about, but it needs to be actualized. Why Thank do you. Africans still need visas to travel in Africa? For me, I just want to say this. I don't know if you'll agree with me. I think the Pan-African spread that was used to establish the African Union is dead. Do you agree with me? Long gone. We often say if the Casablanca group had won in 1963, Africa would be in a different place. There were just seven, seven people. There were only seven, yeah. That's why they lost. So the uh, uh, Monrovia group, they were the majority. They said, oh, let's go slow on this Pan-African thing, on this African unity. Let's go slow. And then after we started going slow, we've been going slow ever since. If we were to go back to the ideals of the Casablanca group, Africa would have been in a very, very much better place uh, by now. When you hear the name Africa, what comes into your mind? Poverty. <laughs> Disease. I mean, I know better, but I know that's what people think. I mean, what comes into your mind? No, in my, in my mind, yep. I see an amazing continent, <laughs> the richest <laughs> continent on earth, a continent full of vibrant young minds, 
a continent that if only we could unite, we can rule the world. That's the Africa I see. But I know the Africa that people out there see. And what is the Africa that they see? The Africa out there, it's a diseased and dying continent at war, constantly at war with itself, hunger and starvation and, and disease, which is far from the truth, which is far from the truth. Look at Zimbabwe. It's listed as one of the top 10 worst places to live, top 10 worst places to invest. And yet, the truth is, it's the exact opposite. We need to have a borderless Africa. Absolutely. To allow Africans to start investing from different African countries. Because I went to Nigeria and I saw a Gambian man building an estate. I mean, he's one of the biggest estates in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And he was invested by a Gambian. But in Africa, when you talk about investment, we say a white man needs to come and invest. Oh, we don't see another African. But we are programmed to feel that uh, it's only going to happen if a white man says so. What do you think a borderless Africa would do to Africans. Oh my God, Africa will take off like wildfire. Just the free movement of people. They came to Cairo Highway to think that a woman can uh, uh, get up in the morning with her produce and uh, by, by mid-morning she's in uh, uh, Kinshasa. And by the following day she's in Cairo. And then she can take an overnight uh, uh, bullet train back to Cape Town. That's the Africa I'm talking about. You talk about commerce. You know, this continent is quite an amazing continent. You'd think that uh, it's Africa and we are similar. No, there are products in Zimbabwe that people in Zambia want. There are products in Zimbabwe or Southern Africa that people in West Africa want. You know, it's, it's amazing how intra-Africa trade alone, we don't need outsiders. Intra-Africa trade alone could change Africa overnight. I don't, I don't, I don't see the reason why these leaders, they, you know, they must sit down and try to, you know, encourage each other. I don't know what, what's happening with these leaders. What, what, what is it? Can you give me a clue what happens? You know, I don't, I don't even meet, know myself. Yeah, it's not that great for, or, or Africa. You know, what do they really discuss? Do they discuss about Africa as Africans or, or what? I don't know. Or they, they discuss about, like, you know, I've got this fifth dome, I've got, you know, what, what do they really discuss? Karakana, you used to be an ambassador for the AU, Correct. and I believe that you have contact of almost every African leader right now. Correct. I mean, I want to know what do they discuss when they, they, they have meetings together? I mean, are they discussing about Africa or are they just discussing about how much money they're going to make? Because I don't get it. To be honest with you, and I say this sincerely, I don't know of any African leader who is in need of money. They're beyond that. They're beyond that. And I'm telling you the truth. You know, if they are, maybe a few. But the majority of them, they're beyond that. They really just want to see Africa move forward. You take, for example, um, this country where we are. You have opposition that goes to Washington two, three times a year to push for sanctions to continue. You look at that situation and say, do they understand the machinery that puts sanctions together? It's a deep web of a machinery that even if, say, opposition wants to win the next election, it's going to take the entire five years to undo the effects and to undo the, the system that was put in place for sanctions. Mm. So that means even you, opposition, you're going to still suffer from the sanctions. So it's that lack of understanding of what really matters at the, at the end of the day that uh, uh, is, is, is of concern to me. So to answer your question about African leadership, it, it's my general feeling that the average African leader wants to do the right thing. But they're not doing the right thing. They're doing the best they can under very difficult conditions. Remember what I said. The average African country is spending a third to 40%, some up to 60% of their GDP 
on loan repayment. That alone, son, it's like saying, you take 6% of my lunch, and then you wonder why I can't gain weight. Mm. I need my entire lunch every day. But if you're going to be taking 60% of my lunch, then you don't even want to talk about my 60% that you have taken. You only want to talk what I can or cannot do with the remaining 30 or 40%. That's what's happening to Africa. When you look at countries that have to pay such huge amounts of uh, loans, uh, given high interest rates that are not justified, mm. a lot of the African countries, uh, many have never defaulted on their loan repayment to all these institutions, mm. and yet the, uh, the rating agencies, they rate them very poorly, so they get, in order to justify giving them high interest rates. You know, countries like Greece that completely collapsed, they get better interest rates than a lot of African countries that have never been in that situation. The international finance system must be analyzed, and we're asking those involved to give Africans a break, and that we must treat Africa fairly. We must demand that. And so the um, unfairness of the, of the world is, 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 a, is of concern. And I think as Africans, is, is, uh, is, and, I, and I'm trying to avoid calling myself black, because I'm not black. We must understand what is really going on. So because before I start trying to defend myself mm. as to why I can't function with 35-40%, mm. I need to first of all expose you for stealing from me. That's not happening. Oh, let's not talk about that. You see, let's just concentrate on why you can't feed your children. But let's not talk about me stealing from you. And now, like I was telling you, the, the stealing, the bullying and the stealing has been going on for so long. Now, they don't even bully us anymore. They don't even steal from us anymore. We bring it to them. We have been so programmed and beaten down. I want us to understand our Africa from that depth where we realize we are being controlled. And if I can take you to why I no longer want to call myself black, because I'm not black. Because mm. the issue of blackness was introduced in order to introduce white supremacy. Wow. The white people from Europe, they were not white before they came to Africa. We were not black before they came to Africa. But they came to Africa and found an amazing continent with some of the most beautiful, indestructible people. But more importantly, the realization that the black gene, the African gene, is the only dominant gene on earth. Genetics 101. Mm. We cannot be destroyed. An African mates with any person from anywhere on earth, the child is black. Right. Because the African gene is indestructible. It is the only dominant gene. The rest of the genes around the world, uh, they are recessive and they can be destroyed. So, Realizing that, that they could, they could destroy us in so many other ways, but that's the one thing they could do nothing about it. Because that's God-given. It's just, it is what it is, <laughs> whether you like it or not. So they try to figure out how then can we destroy these people because here there's nothing we can do. So they say, let's make them believe that we are much better than them. So they introduced white supremacy using color. If you think about it, we went to school, they taught us about the different colors, green, yellow, orange, blue, what have you, black and white, but they chose only two colors to give attributes to. Yep. The attributes to the white color, beautiful, pure, desirable, black, undesirable, mm. you know the rest. And then they said, let's go to church. Then when we went to church, they taught us about heaven and yeah, hell. hell. And they said, heaven, they are angels, they are white. And oh, by the way, we are also white. We don't look white. We are kind of pinkish and variations of pink. But never mind that. We are white like the angels. Hmm. And oh, there's a place called hell. There's this monster that eats people and does all the horrible things and... And by the way, that monster is black. 
Like you. It's the devil. Like you. We said, okay. Think about it. Do you know how long ago this lie has been told? They are not white. We are not black. Yep. But it was used. So every time we go to church, we are worshipping the angels, we are worshipping them subconsciously. And every time we denounce the devil, we're denouncing ourselves because we look like the devil. We are on automatic pilot of sheer stupidity. I was talking to a friend there that I said, I don't know about you. I just kind of uh, jumped in on her. I said, so where is your heaven? I said, my heaven is on the left side and, and the angels over there. I have my own idea of, of heaven and I have my own, my, my, my hell is on, on the right side. She says, oh, mine is the opposite. My heaven is on the <laughs> where, where is your heaven? I guess my, my heaven is in the center. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> But, uh, it is the most, the most stupid thing. That's our program. We have some, you know, do you have, how, how do your angels look like? <laughs> They're whites in cars. <laughs> <laughs> and describe your devil to me. Uh, black. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. So I, I, I'm the devil myself then, since I was a black. There you go. When are we going to break the cycle of the lies? Hmm. The subliminal messaging is what has propelled and propagated white supremacy. And it was a simple concept. The angels are white. White people are white. When they're not white, that's a lie. The devil is black, and you Africans, you're black like the devil. I refuse to be called the black because I'm not. And we've got to put an end to the subliminal messages when we can begin to call ourselves Africans. That's it. I have been telling so many Africans that you are an African, not an African. You know, like we don't believe in ourselves that we can do so many things. That's right. So I don't know if you've we heard emphasize of... on black. Oh, we black people. Oh, we black people. What about we Africans? Africans. The mothers and fathers of humanity, the origin of civilization, the ones who taught the world what it means to be human. That's we, the Africans. Why can't we emphasize on that? We don't, because we're programmed to just demoralize ourselves. We are on a path of self-destruction. How do we get you young people to wake up? Because we are in a trance. Mm. A trance of sheer stupidity. Some of the things that we do as Africans, as people of color, things that, that we could do to help ourselves, we do not do. We are in a trance. We've been put to sleep. What is it going to take for us to realize that we are asleep and we need to wake up. Self-hate in Africa. Oh, it's big. Subliminal messaging. That's where we began the self-hate, the mistrust of each other, the lack of appreciation, an idea that is coming from your brother, an idea that is coming from your sister, because we are taught to dislike anything to do with us. And that is the biggest enemy right now. A colonized African mind is the worst thing Africa can have. I mean, if you have a message to Africans in terms of self-hate, what would that message be? I would say, wake up, Africans. Understand yourself. Understand you're a victim of uh, white, white supremacy. That you are the origin of humanity, and without you, the rest of the world wouldn't be. Without Africa? Without Africa. The world cannot function. Absolutely. The world needs Africa. Africa does not need the world. And that's a fact, and they know it. There is nothing that we need that we cannot find in Africa. Fact. But there is not a single strategic planning session by the Western world and the Eastern world that doesn't start with Africa. Because everybody is looking to Africa for their needs. That's why we have the Africa-China relationship. So we have the Africa-Europe relationship because they cannot do without Africa. Without, Af without Africa, for sure. But we realize the pivotal role we play in the, in the geopolitics of, of Iran. But we've been programmed in a way that we don't think we can make it in Africa. We don't think we're good enough. We don't think we're capable of, of, uh, of taking care of ourselves. Are you happy with the world the way it is today? 
Are you happy living this world the way it is for your children, grandchildren, and generations to come? I hope. The answer is no. 20 years from now, your children and grandchildren are going to ask you, grandfather, grandmother, there were issues with our beloved continent, Africa. There were problems with the race, our race as black people. What did you do, grandmother? What did you do, grandpa? For you to be able to answer that question, that journey begins now. My hope is 20 years from now, you can say, granddaughter, grand, grandson, sit down. These were the issues in our beloved Africa. These were the issues with black people. Together with my brothers and sisters, we came together. We pulled our financial resources together. And this is what we did. While the mission is not yet accomplished, this is where we left off. And this is where you, together with your brothers and sisters, need to come together and pick up where we left off. Mm -hmm.